for joining us. We actually have a huge crew. Um, this is a very exciting day and it's 345. So let's get this party started. Um, I see my fine art project class of super amazing artists. Plus I know Tim Mena's darkroom classes here, black and white darkroom. And you all have had to be super creative um, during this time. And then there's some others as well that are in neither of those classes, but are also wonderful fine artists that are here to learn. So one, I wanna let you know this is all, this is being recorded. So I hope that's okay with everybody. And this is the professional evolution for fine artists. And I am super excited to welcome three wonderful individuals who I've actually known for like, over 10 plus years for mm -hmm. each of them. I was kind of refreshing my memory beforehand and thinking about that. So it's really also um, just lovely for me to see them all because we share a long history. I think being in the Bay Area as artists and art, arts professionals, you really get to know each other and mm -hmm. form a tight knit community. So I just wanna thank these three wonderful people for being here and they are Ray Beldner, from Startup Art Fair, Danny Sanchez, who is the Associate Director of Themes and Projects, and Rula Cycli, who is a curator and writer. And all three people have been wonderful um, individuals that I have worked with in various capacities throughout the years as well. Um, Ray, I actually met through my collaborator on the Dress Tent Project, Robin Lasser, and Ray and Robin many years ago also used to collaborate on projects. Right and out of grad school. Grad school? Yeah. Is that when yeah. you? Wow. Right out of grad school from about 89 to 92. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. And so I think I may have met Ray at one of Robin's parties some years ago or Something like that. I was trying to refresh. I think we mind. met. I think we met at her latka party. Her latka party. Yes. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. And we probably will meet again at that as soon I'm as sure we can we all will. gather. <laughs> and Danny Sanchez is the associate director of themes and projects. And Danny was at San Jose State when I was also there doing grad school. Danny was in the in the undergrad program and I was in grad school there, and we got to know each other a little bit at that time. And then he went on to Modern Book. Yes. Yeah, and you started working at Modern Book. Yes. And then moved to San Francisco with Modern Book. Thankfully, they brought me with them, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you became, you well, yeah. went along with Themes and Projects. Yeah, so yeah, it was just kind of a, a process. Uh, yeah, started with the gallery in Palo Alto, they found a space in the city, moved to the city. We were at Geary and then, uh, and then that's the short version in the Minnesota Street Project. But I was able to work from, work my way up from, you know, intern to part-time to gallery manager to now associate director. Yeah, that's amazing. Crazy. So cool. <laughs> As someone who lives in Palo Alto, do you mind me asking what gallery in Palo Alto you started at? Well, no, it's, it's, it, it was known as Modern Book. Modern was, Book. Yeah. yeah. Wow. It was there that was a 90s. great gallery. Yeah. Right on yeah. the main drag. Yeah, off of university. It, yeah, yeah, in downtown, yeah. Yeah, um, so yeah, so we had 10 great years there. And then, well, when it gets to my portion to talk a little bit more about the gallery, it kind of evolved and then we kind of took the next step since we're talking about evolution, you know, as an artist, um, yeah. there's evolution of the gallery as well. And then Rula Cycli, who I just looked up today, um, I was like, when did we start talking? Mm -hmm. um, and then I think it was around 11 years ago. Yeah. Um, and you were also doing Moed right at the time. Yeah, I was the pro I was um, working in the education office at, at Museum of the African Diaspora and your work came on my radar um, through the exhibition. I do it for my people yeah. and which was a great show. And that's the first time I'd seen you were the tent dresses and really was just blown away by the the conception and, and execution of that project. And it's been a pleasure to sort of see how it has progressed iteratively in the last you know, decade, 11 years or so. And the way, just the expansiveness and the way in which it is so, it so beautifully crosses these lines of, or, you know, 
brings together these lines of culture and politics and uh, and history and you know, sociology, anthropology, like all the ways in which these disciplines sort of overlap in these in, in this project is 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 really breathtaking. Oh, thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you so <laughs> much. <laughs> yeah, so I've actually had the honor of working with Rula as well as she's written or curated projects through the years and. Um, Rula is always engaged in very contemporary, interesting um, shows and exhibitions and writings. And I think it's very important that we all push our thinking around contemporary thought. And um, I really appreciate Rula's work on that. And we were able to work together with Kathy on the show mm -hmm. Two, two years, years ago? ago. Yeah, two years the ago. Yeah, it was up uh, two years ago this May, actually. So just astonishing how quickly it's all just flown by. But <laughs> but yeah, that was you were your work with Robin was one of the last um, projects that we thought about. And it, in some ways, it really pulled all of like these a few of these um, sort of loose ends as far as what we were trying to execute in the exhibition pulled a lot of it together. And I think you were, you were, that project was one of the last that we sort of settled on and felt really, really good about what the, A, the artist roster, and B, what the overall look of the exhibition, um, how that would, how it would, you know, what final form it would take. And yeah, you, that project was sort of a, a linchpin in many ways, which was great. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just great. Oh. I mean, it's, so as you all can see, if you've, and also you know that if you take class with me, I say this a lot, is that what you'll find is that you will all develop relationships with each other and with your community. And over the years, you will all get to connect and be together and be friends and work together. And um, it's starting now. So, mm -hmm. you know, like the time in school with, all of this talent that we have swirling around us, we're so fortunate. But then after school as well, you can see um, Danny and Rula and Ray and I, we've all known each other in various capacities for, for many years now. So I hope that you enjoy those relationships and really get to work and challenge um, one another, work with and challenge one another as you all go on as well. So, this is the professional evolution for fine artists. And oftentimes, you know, we don't take a path that is like step A, step B, step C. There's always kind of an interweaving and everybody's path is a little bit different. Um, we have three professionals here and I thought what a better, what a great way to start would be to have them talk about their professional evolution. How did you get to where you are now? And the second question is, in relationship to that, you are all in a position of working with artists. So how did you get to where you are now? And how do you find the artists that you work with? Mm -hmm. So who would like to start, Avrula, Danny, and Ray? I can go first. <laughs> okay, Danny. Uh, yeah, right. well, yeah. So for myself, similar to all of you, um, I was in my last year at San Jose State and um, kind of thinking ahead, like, you know, what am I going to do? At the time, I was working full time at my mall job at a video store, if you remember video stores and music stores. And um, it was 2006. And um, that industry was kind of going down. And sadly, the company had filed for bankruptcy, got laid off. And I'd been at that job for 10, 11 years. It was my first job. And I was able to work my way up there. And um, so I, in one of my lighting classes, I was a TA and someone had come in and they're like, oh, they're, we're looking for an intern this summer. It's for an art gallery in Palo Alto, modern book. Um, for me, I was living in San Jose. I didn't really get out too often. I was very kind of just sheltered there. Um, so I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll check it out. I have nothing to do this summer. And so interviewed for the position and uh, was able to get the intern uh, spot. And uh, for me, I was kind of curious you know, learning the behind the scenes, like how does the gallery select their artists? You know, how does the business run? And um, that's what kind of made sense for me. So I was kind of juggling, you know, me as the artist and then me as trying to find a professional job to make a living. And that was something that didn't occur to me, you know, when I was finishing school, because I thought I finished school, I'll just be a full-time photographer. Um, it takes dedication, but I feel very lucky that I was able to fall into the position with the gallery and kind of go that route and learn um, behind the scenes. Um, what else? <laughs> um, 
I'm sorry, Adrian. No, uh, okay. The question, um, I actually have two questions for you in relationship to that, because you've continued as an artist with your yeah. SX70 work. And if you could address that, and then also how do you find, how are artists found for the galleries that you're working with and in? Gotcha. So, um, so, with, so with the gallery, kind of going back to when it first started, um, the gallery was known as Modern Book and opened up as a boutique bookshop. And um, they kind of did this hybrid because they had all these great empty walls, but there wasn't really any art in it. Being based in Palo Alto, there's a big photography community there. And there were a lot of local artists kind of approaching and just asking to show in the space. And um, the owners, you know, thought, yeah, that kind of makes sense. It goes with what we're doing. And that's how we were able to kind of build a relationship and build a roster. Um, as the gallery continued to grow, art fairs were coming onto the scene. And in the early mid 2000s, um, they decided to start doing art fairs. And so that was another way for us to kind of bring our artists to the forefront, but then also see other talent outside the Bay Area. Um, and then as for myself, um, so finishing school, being that I love photography, I didn't have access to all the things I did when I was in school. And I thought, well, what medium can help me do this? I mean, I love black and white darkroom photography, but I just didn't have the patience for it. I love digital, but I didn't have a printer. I didn't want to have to outsource everything. So I thought, well, what could I do to kind of have it all together? And um, I just fell in love with Polaroid as a medium. Sadly, at that time, Polaroid as a company had announced that they were no longer going to make instant film anymore. And there was kind of this huge upset within the community. And somehow some people got together. They got the last factory in the Netherlands and decided that they were going to try to reinvent the medium. Um, so it's kind of been fun going on that journey, testing out their films and kind of reliving the history of photography in a nutshell, because like the first films came out, it, the exposures weren't very good, but every six months they would refine the formula and would get better and better. And at this point, it's, it's pretty decent. Um, but Polaroid is kind of a hard medium to, uh, to kind of sell, I feel like. Um, I've done group shows and would do call for entries and I would get in, but it'd be kind of difficult to move. So lately I've been trying to think of other ways to kind of present pieces, whether they're kind of in a mosaic, kind of David Hockney type presentation to make it bigger than what it really is. Um, also too, Instagram has been great. And back in the day, I'd say Flickr was kind of the Instagram of the time because uh, there'd be all these little groups and you'd find these Polaroid groups and other people and connect. Um, I'd also kind of set up Google search for a call for entries because it was such a niche medium that sometimes it was hard to find places to exhibit. Um, and that's helped me to find um, these exhibitions kind of in Europe or even this uh, German company that would do a, a Polaroid tear sheet calendar. So each day would be a different Polaroid. Uh, and they first did that back in 2012. Cool, thank you. All right, Rula, would you like to go next? Yeah, I was just unmuting just in case I was okay. um, uh, either typing notes and other extraneous cat related noises. Oh, on. yes. Oh, yes. The um, animal but, visitations but, have been wonderful. <laughs> um, I started, I think, on a, a fairly straightforward, what looked to be at the time um, a path toward academia. So I pursued art history in college and uh, was, you know, I've been an interested, I've been interested in visual culture, um, but particularly photography since the time I was, I mean, before I can even, before my memory actually really begins, I think it goes back to even like well before that. So it's been a, a sort of a shaping force in, in how I've grown up and um, shaped all manner of important decisions I've made in my life. Um, but after I graduated from college, I wasn't 100% sure if uh, the path toward an academic existence, so the master's and the PhD and the research and the writing and all of that, I was never really sure if that was something I wanted to do. And in my 20s and actually well into my 30s, there was this feeling of like, oh no, I should do that. I should definitely do that. In spite of the fact that instinctually I was responding to this um, impulse, which was like, you may not, that may not be your, you know, your calling. And so uh, thinking, thinking about um, jobs working in the arts, um, most curatorial positions, for example, require at a minimum, it used to be the MA, but now it's more often the PhD. In fact, that's the, those are the sort of working papers in this day and age. Um, so it, uh, I sort of came of age professionally sort of right in between the time when the master's was enough 
and sort of progressing from there into sort of the professionalization of art history, um, where the PhD became the um, mandatory degree for to, to work in most institutions. Um, and so that was uh, that was a bit of a reckoning. I knew enough not to pursue that, uh, but there was still some feeling of how, you know, what am I going to do as far as, you know, um, setting myself up professionally. And I am definitely someone who is not altogether comfortable as um, as a freelance, as a free, I, am, I am a freelancer and I've worked that way for at least since I finished graduate school at CCA in 2012. Um, but I always felt that I was more accustomed to uh, the work environment that a, that a formal sort of institutional position would allow for. But as I've gotten older and worked more and more, especially here in the Bay Area art scene, um, I have more and more questions and conflicts with the ways in which institutions operate, um, questions about who they serve, who their audiences are, um, what due diligence they do as far as who is collected into their exhibition, into their permanent collections, what kind of exhibitions they host, either long form or temporary. Um, and it's as much as I revere institutions, museums for what they are as potential uh, community partners and sort of operating in a service position. Um, there are more and more operated like businesses because we live in the United States and that's capitalism. <laughs> um, but that really, I think, conflicts. It drives a wedge between what mission is and what operation is. And I've really, after my, my last truly institutional position was Museum of the African Diaspora. And since then, uh, I've thought about other positions and applied for a few, but never really found the right one. I'm not sure that there is a right one. So that has me sort of carving out my own path as an independent art or independent curator and writer. And, um, and I've been very fortunate to do the work that I do. Uh, a lot of them come through collaboration. So Adrian, you mentioned Betweenscapes at uh, Soma Arts, and that was summer of 2020. That was a, a, a wonderful collaboration with, Doc with Dr. Kathy Zoror. Um, and uh, right now, I'm, and we'll get to this later, but right now I'm working on a collaboration with Sharon Bliss and Kevin Chen at uh, San Francisco State University. Um, that exhibition was supposed to open in October, but we're not 100% sure that's gonna happen. So right now we're thinking about what does that look like as a virtual presentation. Um, I like working by myself. Um, I do that almost exclusively as a writer. As a curator, I do. The, I also work by myself, but I think I find my best work when I'm working collaboratively. And a lot of that has to do with just an exchange of ideas, an exchange of energy, um, there's just more thought power, there's more consideration, there's more analysis and critique that comes into those kind of dialogues than a solo curator, I think, is capable of, of producing on their own. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's been a, a lovely, at times very challenging, winding path to get to where I am, but um, I've learned a lot just about what it means to maintain a passion and sort of keep pushing forward when all you want to do is work with artists and talk to them and write about their work and understanding that that's not something that gets uh, you're well paid for in this country. And so you find other ways of, um, you know, it's the, it's the same story, pretty much anyone working in the Bay Area who doesn't work in tech, <laughs> yeah. uh, you find a side gig and you find other ways to make it happen. And so that's what you do. And slowly but surely I've been able to um, build up good standing in the Bay Area. I'm very fortunate to work with the artists and the institutions I do. And keeping that, uh, sort of protecting that is, is something I put a lot of thought and energy into. And um, Adrian, you said at the top, sort of what comes of the professional and educational connections we make. And this is where those professional education, educational uh, connections and just doing right by the people we work with, like where that all comes to fruition, so. Yeah. Ooh, thank you. <laughs> Ray, do you wanna give a, uh, a little bit of your evolution and what you're doing now, because you have an interesting path as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I've, I've been around for a while, so I've taken a lot of uh, detours along the way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm born and raised in San Francisco. I went to the Art Institute where I got my undergraduate degree in painting and printmaking. And then I went to Mills, where I got a degree, my graduate degree in sculpture, and I studied with people like Jay DeFeo and Catherine Wagner and Ron Nagel, 
So I, I had some good mentors in my past. Um, I met our friend Robin Lasser in graduate school and she was a photographer and I was a sculptor and we collaborated on many different projects for several years um, all over California and the Bay Area. Um, I've taught at probably every school in the Bay Area. Um, I've taught at Mills, I've taught at Santa Cruz, Berkeley, not Berkeley, sorry, CCA, the Art Institute, San Francisco State, uh, College of Notre Dame de Namur. Um, I've worked with students at San Jose State. I actually curated one of their MFA shows a few years ago. So I've, you know, I, I this is my home and I know a lot of people in it. Um, and I've been working as an, as an artist for about 25 years and um, I've shown in, you know, all over the world and Europe, New York, Asia. I used to have gallery representation in LA and San Francisco and New York. Um, I have work in major museums from the Smithsonian to the, all the local Bay Area museums. And I taught for about, I think, 20 years. Um, and one of my specialties was besides teaching the things that I know about, which is sculpture, installation, interdisciplinary studies, social practice, I started the very first professional practices class at the Art Institute. Because as an artist, you know, when I was growing up, um, one of the things that I felt really disappointed by in my education was that nobody prepared me to be an artist, a working artist in the world. I, I used to tell my students that I learned about the art world like I learned about sex. I picked it up in the streets. You know, <laughs> Nobody told me anything. It was all by inference and things I heard here and stuff my friends would tell me. You know, I had a few great mentors, John Roloff, at the, both at the Art Institute and at Mills, helped me a lot professionally when I was starting out. Jay DeFeo, when she was still alive, God rest her soul, helped me professionally. But if it weren't for these few people, I wouldn't have known what to do once I graduated. And when I became a teacher, I would see students year after year, promising young students who made amazing work and they would graduate. And in a few years, I would never hear from them again. And I wonder to myself, why was that? Well, because we don't tell them how to actually build a career as an artist. We don't give them examples. We don't, you know, um, give them basic life and business skills to survive. And so, uh, you know, the one thing that I'm very passionate about is helping young artists start their careers, maintain their careers, get some kind of a toehold, because this is not an easy business to be in. It's not appreciated, it's not compensated well. You know, the old paradigm that I grew up with was, you got your MFA, you got into a gallery, the next year you were in the Whitney Biennial. Boom, that's how it works. <laughs> and that's never been true and still isn't true. And yet people still seem to think that by getting a degree, you're magically gonna become not even a famous artist, but a successful or a solvent one. Mm -hmm. So, and part of the, so, so, so uh, beyond teaching, what I've done is um, I've had a variety of small businesses um, because as much as I love teaching and I love the interaction with students, I also feel like teaching is very limited in terms of what it does for me and what I can do for other people. Um, and I've always been more entrepreneurial. I've always had my own business. So I, I worked in, I worked my way through college by having my own construction company. I did plumbing and electrical. I got out of school debt free. Um, I've owned laundromats. I've had, you know, I worked as a, I still do, I actually manage an art collection of a well-known Bay Area art collector. I'm an art appraiser. Um, I've done art restoration. Wow. Because 
those jobs give me flexibility. They pay extremely well. And I don't have to deal with the bullshit of academia, as you probably are all very well aware of. Um, but the last business I started, Startup Art Fair, was directly related to my own passion about helping artists and my own personal needs. When I went through a very long, painful, and expensive divorce, I found myself on the other side of that wanting to get back exhibiting my work after a, a fairly long hiatus for me, like four or five years. And I was thinking, well, rather than going through a gallery, it would be just really nice to be able to bring my work directly to an art fair public because the art fairs are the way until very, very recently, most art business has been done in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, and I thought, well, why do I have to use a gallery? Can I just bring my work to a fair? Most fairs are for galleries only. So I was looking for an artist fair where I could represent myself. And there weren't that many, and the ones that were there were pretty shitty. So um, I called up a friend of mine who used to own a gallery, Steve Zavatero, and told him my idea. And we founded Startup Art Fair five years ago. And we created the kind of fair that we wanted to see for artists, one that was artist-centric, cared about what they did, presented their work in a professional way, um, was vetted so that you knew if you got in there, it just wasn't a pay to play kind of deal, had all the bells and whistles of a regular art fair, um, you know, panel discussions, performances, et cetera. And so that's what I've been doing for the last five years, along with trying to make my own work. And now that COVID has hit us, that's come to a complete screeching halt and uh but the upside is i was telling adrian earlier i've never spent this much time in my studio i'm getting a ton of shit done i mean you can see i've got all kinds of things going on in the background um it's allowed me to redo my website put my work into a database organize my files it's been heaven in a in a, in a way um but eventually i'll need to have a some kind of a job i'm sure <laughs> but anyway, so that's me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I want to go back to this question because here in this room, we have so much talent that's about to go out there in the world. So you guys, most of you address this a little bit, but how do you find artists that you want to work with? Or how does your organization or gallery or for Rula, who's a writer, like how do you find these people that you want to work with? And what, maybe these are two different questions, but if you want to incorporate this in your answer, um, what do you think for these folks that are, you know, producing this incredible work right now? What do you think that they should do as some of their first steps to get out there in the art world? I would love to answer that. Okay. I'm all, I'm all jacked up from talking about myself. So let me just let me talk about this for a second. Um, the way that we find, I'm very fortunate because I am a working artist. I've been in the Bay Area my whole life and I've had a 25 year career. I know a ton of artists. So the way that we find artists for our website is really through our personal networks. But okay. we do an online open call so anybody can apply. It doesn't matter where you're from. And we have artists that apply and get in from China, South America, all over the United States, Canada, Mexico, uh, Australia. So it's very democratic, but I also actually actively look for artists constantly. Um, if I see them on Instagram or Facebook or a website or somebody else's website or newsletter, and I subscribe to a ton of different things, I'll just reach out to them and say, I love your work. Have you ever considered doing an artist fair? Here's what we're all about. Um, so that's how, how we find it. We find artists. The other thing I want to say about you were saying, how should people be prepared when they leave school? Mm -hmm. You guys are photographers. Am I right about that? Or some of you? They're definitely yeah. photography based. Some of yeah. them also do mixed media and installation yeah. art as well. But the, the faces in the room are definitely photo centric yeah. to start with. 
Right. Well, that's good because the, I was going to say the main thing you need are really, really good images. Yeah. As the art world becomes less online and more less offline and more online, and as most people most people find artists online. So if you don't have good images, you got nothing. You know, nine out of ten people are going to see your work online. You have to have good images. That's number one. You have to have a social media presence. It's I'm I'm feeling right now, even though I just redid my website, I'm thinking, why bother? I mean, I've just been posting things on Instagram and Facebook, and I've gotten more attention and more sales through that than I've ever have in my life. So I'm not saying you shouldn't have a website, but you have to have an online presence of some sort, and a social media one's a great place to start. But good images are really the key, too. Yeah. Yeah, to kind of piggyback off what Ray uh, was saying, I mean, I think with social media, I try to, you know, also have you as the artist, not just you as personal, um, just because that helps to kind of build your brand. Um, but also, too, if you're kind of conflicted, like think of it as a visual diary. You know, with social media, you could be a little more informal, but it's more focused on you and your process and how you come up with your art. Um, to go back to how the gallery finds artists, um, you know, in normal times, um, there's been times that I've been invited to do portfolio reviews and um, that portfolio reviews are great because if you haven't participated, it's like speed dating. You get 20 minutes with either a gallerist, a curator, a photo editor, you get so many different people. And for me, I like when I have someone who has an idea that's kind of wanting to work through it and, and curious to see if it's working. Um, but sometimes I get people that already have the full fleshed vision, but you know, being that I'm coming from a gallery, they want to know like, is this something that, that the gallery can exhibit. And for galleries, our overall objective is to sell art, you know, unlike a museum where they can really take a chance on a narrative and a really deep story um, with us. We want that, but it has to be sellable. And that is, is it's a huge umbrella. So this depends on, on our audience. And, you know, things are always changing, tastes are always changing. So what I would say as you move forward and you guys are visiting galleries, make a short list of your favorites. Um, and then do some due diligence and dig in and see their rosters, see the type of art that they're showing and make sure that if you want to show there that what you're doing is not competing with someone they're already working with, but kind of complements the vision. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's something I wish I knew earlier, like to kind of make the short list of galleries. Um, but it's kind of funny too, because in the old days, it would be an artist submission. You know, artists would come in and ask the gallery if they're taking submissions. 100% of the time, they're probably going to say no. Um, mm -hmm. But I would say... Um, you know, maybe create like a special like little like takeaway that you can mail to them, you know, and like have it, you know, your name, your image, maybe your social media. Um, Cause there was, there's been times in the past that we've gotten postcards and it's great. Like we love the image. We have a lot on our plate going on with the day-to-day -day operations, but the postcards like always there on the desk or always yeah. somewhere that we can, like our inspiration board. And when, when the timing's right, it's like, oh yeah, there was so-and-so and they did this image. Let's, let's reach out, let's check out their website, you know, sort of thing. Um, Going back to social media, you know, follow some of your favorite galleries and um, like what they're posting, maybe comment too. I would say never tag them in your own personal post to have them come look at your work because sometimes that can be a little annoying. Um, but, you know, for me personally, as I see people like and follow us, I'll be curious to see what they're about and uh, I'll check out their stuff like, oh, this person's an artist. So um, that, that's another way to kind of keep things in our minds. Um, yeah. I, I wanted to also mention the thing about portfolio reviews, Danny, because I think that's that's a great, especially for photographers. There's something about the photography community. They're all about portfolio reviews. And it's a fantastic way for a lot of people really quickly to look at your work. And I have a ton of friends who are photographers who have gotten incredible press exhibition and sales through doing like, you know, Houston Photo Fest or something like that, or even the, the local ones. So, uh, and it's a great way to get feedback on your work if you're a young artist. I have actually found several artists who I have encouraged to apply to our fair and have gotten in and have done amazingly well. But I've also made love connections between artists that I've seen at photo, um, uh, sorry, uh, portfolio reviews, and I've just called up dealers and said, you got to see this person. Mm. So that's why I think they're, that's a great speed dating yeah. way to <laughs> meet enough people, a lot of people in the art world. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would, you know, reinforcing exactly what Ray and Danny were saying, um, 
as a writer and curator, uh, it's portfolio reviews, I think, are what it's one of the most fulsome ways to see work that I wouldn't have seen under any other circumstances. And so I jump at the chances as, as, as often as I'm invited and as often as I, as I can afford it. I will go to Houston um, this year was ill-fated for, yeah. for the biggest viral reason possible. Um, but before all of that, so Society for Photographic Education was also in Houston this year. And one conference like ran right into the opening of um, PhotoFest. And so, and this year was, you know, exactly like every other year that I've had the chance to attend and operate as a portfolio reviewer, which is to say that I saw work that I never would have seen otherwise. And yeah. um, so I'm thinking about Filter Photo Festival in Chicago, uh, Medium, which is in San Diego, Photo Lucida, uh, Filter. There's a whole long list of them. And it can be expensive to attend. And it really makes sense for, I think, an artist to look at the, the reviewer list. If there's someone in particular that you mm -hmm. want to talk to, if you can afford to go and schedule something with them, I think it's absolutely worth your time and effort to make that happen because not only do you have a conversation with that person in that you know 20 minute speed dating experience, yeah. which is perfectly <laughs> described, but also you're going to meet other artists, you're going to meet other reviewers, you're going to meet curators, you're going to meet so many people who are literally collected in this one place for exactly the reason that you are there. So if it's at all possible to work, you know, at a a festival or a portfolio review that you might have to travel for into your budget every year, it's absolutely worth doing it. Um, I would also say look for open calls. There's work that I, again, would never have known about unless there was an open call put out to artists to submit their work to. Um, I did one, I juried, I juried two shows recently, one that's currently still up in Access Gallery up in Sacramento, but it's shuttered. Um, and that was, it's called Portraits Without People. And I, we were just Sort of, I was curious about the notion of how do we look at this? How do we look at the established genre of photographic portraiture, um, but remove the human element from that? What are sort of these surrogates or stand-ins that take the place of the human form that convey something about who we are or what we value or what our passions, our interests, our curiosities are? So there was that. And then last year at the Colorado Center for Photographic Arts, I curated, and this one also sort of had to do with identity, but the question was, who are you? And taking advantage of this moment in which we are looking at ourselves as um, individuals, as we look at ourselves as discrete communities, as societies, a as a diverse population in the United States and in the world, and what all of that means, how do we define identity for ourselves? Um, and, and both of those calls produced, uh, or for me, brought in work that I never would have seen otherwise. And now those artists are on my radar. And so if the time comes that I'm thinking about other exhibition ideas and I want to execute on that, I have a long list of artists that I want to go back and revisit what I'd already seen. I'll go check out their website to see if there's anything new. So um, again, reinforcing the notion of like, you have to have a presence online. Um, if that's a website, if that's how you marshal social media, if that's Twitter or Instagram or Facebook. Of the three, I think Instagram is the most useful because it is so image forward and it's, uh, it's fast, it's nimble and it's constantly changing. That can be a bit overwhelming at times, but it also, it opens up ways of thinking, looking at work and thinking about work that, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we simply didn't have. So there's a, there's a connectivity to that that I really appreciate. It can be really, really overwhelming at times. And there are days where I just feel like I'm never going to know everything and I'm never going to see everything. And that's a little bit disappointing, but <laughs> that's okay. It's, it's always tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but what I do see and what I do take in, like there's, there's always, you know, I, I've benefited from that in my thinking and my writing as a curator, as an artist, like it's one of the best things that I think we can do. And because from there it leads to studio visits, it leads to conversations like this, like in, you know, social media is, it's a beginning, it's not the beginning and the ending. Like, so treating it as that departure point, I think is really smart um, for artists and for people working with artists. So curators, writers, whoever you are. So yeah, it's a, it's a good thing to, to get comfortable with. And get comfortable with the notion of, of networking. Like you cannot do this by yourself, no matter what, you know, the impetus as far as the soul sort of 
operator, uh, you know, artist working in their studio, like all of that hard work is absolutely necessary, but without your network and without actively cultivating it regularly, you're not going to get a lot of leverage, I think, as far as getting your work shown. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious because I have another roundtable discussion question, but I did want to, we have so many wonderful people in the room. Are there any questions that are coming up as you hear Ray, Danny, and Rula talk that you would like to ask them since um, we have about 15 I've, minutes left? I've got a question. Um, yeah. So they've paired me with a few writers for some of the events I've shot. Yeah. For Rula specifically. Um, how do you build that relationship with who you're shooting with? Um, what's it like when you do or don't like working with the other creative in your space? Um, because I like some of the writers I work with and I don't like some of the writers I work with. Okay. Um, that is, that's a, a, a professional relationship. I've never really, I've never strayed into that realm, what, what you're describing. Um, more often, if, if I'm working as an operator, if I'm working as a creator, or right, I should say. Uh, chances are the work is, it's a set body of work. It's a, you know, a, a series that's either in progress or close to a culminating point, um, or it's something I've seen their work exhibited somewhere and circumstances are such that it, I come into an opportunity to write about their work, work with them and write about their work. Uh, from my vantage point, because I don't have, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm officially affiliated with Humble Arts Foundation and Photograph Magazine and Hyperallergic and a few others. Um, but because I'm a freelancer, I can pick and choose what I want to write about. So if there's someone's work that I'm just not feeling, um, that for me is a big sort of instinctual check as to whether or not whatever I would write about them would be worth reading and would do right by the work itself. So if there is something out there that if a, if a writer approaches me and they want me to write, I have to have a pretty strong like response to to the work, whatever that is, to want to write about it. Because if I don't have that instinctual response, like the writing is going to be crap. And I've learned this the hard way <laughs> on more than one occasion. And I'm finally at the point where I trust my instincts where that's concerned. And I just, if I know, if I know that it's not going to be a workable relationship, then I don't pursue it. Um, as far as what you're describing, like working with writers that you may not either get along with personally or professionally. Um, my guess is that you have sort of been put together by a larger agency or a, a, some in, an institution or a larger body that has sort of put the two of you together. Um, I think it's worth it to, if you can, find a way to find some common ground, whatever that is, um, be it in the work or in your personal relationship or, you know, any, any other number of ways I think that two people can sort of find common ground. Um, but it's 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 always a good learning experience. Um, but if there's if you're having a really sort of strong response to that, also you know what's going to work best for your work. If there's an editor you're working with, someone like a third mediating party, um, it I think it's worth it to talk to them as well, just so that they know sort of that maybe something isn't quite fitting right. Because I do think in the long run, if it's not a great fit for you, chances are it's not a great fit for that writer either, and that just. I don't know. I think that undermines any potential collaboration that you might have there. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, I get paired with like various music writers because I cover okay. live events and shows. Oh, okay. And sometimes, like sometimes, I work with uh, people that do like incredibly deep dives on like the artist profile. I really like working with that, and we'll do something about you know, like someone's album is about to come out, so we do yeah. like a big pairing on that. But a lot of it seems just to be very shallow writing about mm -hmm. like this event that we're doing and it just i like the paycheck i don't sure. like where the work is reflected mm -hmm. on me it'll yeah. just be you know image here figure one this show yeah photo and then just a very cursory uh like glaze over what happened at the show like the last one i did was um primus on new year's eve and oh, okay. the writer was like a good friend of mine um, so I gave, I kind of threw them a bone. They wanted someone to write about it, but that's why you separate friends and work. So, yeah, that could be, that, that's often a big part of it. Um, I, if, 
I don't know. I think the nature of the work that I do is I ultimately, I will forge some kind of relationship with someone if I'm writing about their work. Um, but I wouldn't say that they're always like the best of possible friendships. Like if that happens to be the case, that's great. If not, then, um, I do, yeah, I do think it comes down to like finding at least a minimum of common ground, whatever that might be, because without that, it's, it's really hard to, in my experience, if I'm talking to the artist, talking to the photographer, like to get out of them what I need in order to, be able to write about their work. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not the easiest position that you're in, but it sounds like you're trying to navigate it as, as well as you can, sort of keeping in mind, this is a job and it's something you want to do as far as cultivating your, your brand and your building your network. Um, but this may be one of those lessons that you just sort of learn as you're doing it and take notes as to what you want to do differently the next time. Yeah. I mean, I thank you so much. I really yeah. appreciate it. I'm, I'm trying to get what I can done. I've started finding writers I like working with. So oh, I'm finding writers that I think are a little less engaging. So that's good. That was, I mean, when Adrian told us we were having like a great writer about fine mm -hmm. art, I was just like, oh, I got mad questions. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And feel free, like get your, if you want, get my email from Adrian. Like I'm more than happy to follow up with you. Oh, absolutely. I will. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that would be Thank great. You I'd so love much. to. You're welcome. I'd love to. Thank you. I have Pete. a question um, for Ray. May I ask a question? Yeah, Pete. Is, Go ahead. Hi, Ray. Uh, uh, this is in regard, and for all of you, actually, all three of you. Um, but specifically, I'm looking at your work, Ray. That's why um, I, pre I appreciate your col collage portraits. Thank and you. And also the 101 portrait idea, which is really uh -huh. fascinating. But in any case, you have a, hum a very large uh, body of work very impressive, which obviously alludes to your 25 years in the business. My question is, is as a beginning artist or wherever we are in our careers, um, sometimes I see these presentations like there's so much uh, visual information that it can be overloading, overstimulating. And sometimes some people's uh, portfolios are like a, a New York boutique where there's like one <laughs> shirt on a rack. You know what are I mean? You, are you referring to people's websites? I am. Yeah. Pretty much. And so yeah. my question is, is there a sweet spot? What's preferred? What as a, as a not as a personally as an artist yourself, because I can see how you present yourself, but as mm -hmm. a buyer, as a, somebody who, who you're looking to yeah. represent, well, is less more or is more more? <laughs> I mean, everybody probably has a different preference on this, and Danny could probably address this too, coming from a gallery perspective. But as you know, an art fair guy, and as a, an art collector myself, and as an artist, I know on my own website, I'm trying to strike a balance between having enough work so you understand the particular body, and also um, not overwhelming people, because you don't want to scroll or have page after page after page. Um, on my website, you're seeing literally a tenth of what I've done. I mean, oh. I've cut out all the public art, all the installations, uh, so much work on paper. It's honed down to a tiny, tiny bit. And I'm still trying to figure it out for myself. But when I go to other people's websites, I actually don't need a whole lot to understand what they do because I'm looking at them not to necessarily buy, but to understand the quality of their work. And there's three things that I look for that I think are incredibly important. And one is I want to see a CV and or a bio. I want to know, you know, besides the work, if I, you know, obviously the work is going to be there. It's going to be well shot. It's going to be organized in a way that's accessible. Um, there's going to be an artist statement that elucidates the work for me. Um, not too long, not too boring, but, and on top of that, I, I, you know, per, artists, professionals in the art world want to know what you've done and you don't have to lie or pretend or beef up your resume, but it's really nice to just have one on there. And it's really nice to have a simple, you know, narrative bio. You know, Ray Beldner is a sculptor and he went here and he did this and he's in this collection, blah, blah, blah. It's just a great way for me to get an instant snapshot of the person. And then the other thing that I think artists should have besides a, a, a clean CV and bio, 
fucking contact information, people. What the fuck? It's like I go to some websites and they're like, like oh yeah, mystery. contact him at this page. And it's a form. I'm not filling out your goddamn form. Give me your email and your phone number so I can reach you. If you want to be reached, <laughs> let me reach you. If you think I'm going to spam you or put you on some kind of a list, it's not Question going to happen. That. I want to reach that. you. Let me reach you. Let me, let me help you. Help me help you. So that's one of my biggest pet peeves. But those three things are the things yeah. I look for besides the work, right? You know, good work, clean work, well presented. But those three things are the other professional things you need. I don't need a giant scrolling artist statement. Really, it should be a half a page at the most. Mm -hmm. um, I don't need your entire resume. My resume is 20 pages long. I had to hone it down for my website. It's down to nine. And just, you know, I, it should be shorter. It really should be shorter. Anyway. So. Now, Pete, now, Pete are, do, you, what, do you have a particular situation that you're trying to edit down for your website? Oh, gosh. I mean, it's like an ongoing thing. I add a category, then I take it off. And I add a new one. It depends on who I'm talking to. Like, I'm doing, I'm a photographer, and my, it's mostly fashion-based. But I'm trying to, I incorporate a fine art element. So again, depending on the season or what, whatever I'm trying to, whatever gig I'm trying to get in a sense. Well, I wonder too, I mean, you can choose all the time. I wonder too, you can also just, you know, have essentially a category. So maybe it's your fashion category, then your mm -hmm. fine art category. And then when you kick, you click on, you know, your fine art category, then there could be subcategories of sure. the different themes of work or whatnot. Um, yeah. I mean, I think as long as at first glance, it looks like it's easy to navigate and then people choose their, their route, then you can delve in deeper. If you have to click, if somebody has to click more than two or three times to get to a, an artwork, you're going to lose them. But mm -hmm. it's true. I would definitely separate the professional photography thing from the fine art in kind of gross categories. And then you can figure out what you want in each, in each side. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I, I struggle with that constantly. Thank you uh, for pointing out the contact info. A, a lot of, well, I'll speak for myself. A lot of my websites have been uh, template based, yeah. template generated. And so you get this like your, your, your contact is that form that would you speak of. So I didn't know it was a, it yeah. was a problem. <laughs> It'll be well, going. Because I'm, because I'm always researching artists for the, for the fair and I, I want to invite people I like oh, to yeah. apply to the fair. Mm. I'll go to their website. And if I go to a website and then all I have is a contact page, it's, it, it makes me wonder, does this person want anyone to contact them? Because mm. I'm just not filling out your contact page. I'm sorry. It, just, it really makes me crazy. And it's easy to have a blank page where you just have, you know, your, your email and your phone number and whatever mm -hmm. you want. I'm not saying give me your address so I can go stalk you, but I, I do want to reach you with an email or a phone number. <laughs> yeah, so you're saying that page. if I have a page on my website for contact, it's like a form submission because what I have right now is like you can send me a submission and then it redirects to my email and I will contact someone back. You don't like that? Yeah. You want like the direct contact? Yep. I don't know. Do you ever fill out contact forms on people's websites? I mean. When I buy prints from them, yeah. That's I it. don't. I, it, really, it really annoys me. And it also okay. makes me think, what are you hiding? <laughs> are you uh, just my email is an email instead of like a you know a nice me at my website whatever email what's that um one of our other people was just always like never have your email be like gmail whatever so it always redirects through my website to my gmail um yeah just said it looked more professional that way but if you're saying this I'm taking that. Taking I don't know, break. man. I'm just telling you what I like. And, uh, yeah. you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how Danny feels about it or Rula feels about it. But mm -hmm. um, actually, Rula, I wanted to ask you as a writer in yeah. regards to the ubiquitous bio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's like a lot of times, you know, I've, I've been I've heard that you speak in the third person or you don't. You speak as yourself okay. or I mean, what does it what do you prefer to read? I prefer to read it written in the first person. Um, the third person, it starts to sound like you're writing a manifesto and that never ends well. <laughs> so, um, 
<laughs> like, don't move to Wyoming. Don't do it. Don't do it. Um, but, uh, but no, I like to, because it also, it, there's something very, um, empowering about writing in first person. Like I am, you know, as an example, like I am a writer and curator based in Berkeley, California. Um, you know, there'll be times when if I have to submit my bio to a portfolio review or something like then it's in the third person rule of cycling works is a writer and curator based in, you know, and that's fine. That's another institution's format, but for myself, like on my website, um, which I will admit right now doesn't exist. And I've been threatening to make it happen for the last few years. <laughs> if it doesn't happen during quarantine, I don't know what to say about when myself will it? at that point. <laughs> I'm such a technophobe. Um, but it's, but no, there's a, I, I prefer to read about it, you know, from the first person because it's, it speaks to the competence to me and as a, as a reader, like it speaks to the competence you have in your, in your product. So mm -hmm. I think you also, you I think you also have to like, think about what, what it's going to be used for. Yeah. And my bio, my artist statements in the first person, my bios in the third person, because yeah. when people want a bio, they typically want it for some presentation. Mm -hmm. And they're, if it's not in the third person, they're going to put it in the third person. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so you can skip a step by having it in the third person. But I kind of like what you're saying, Rula, that mm -hmm. as a reader of it, yeah, you want to feel connected to that person. Yeah. Well, that leads me to that. So, uh, you, meaning like, do you want to hear about my artwork? Do you want to hear about my work? Or do you want to hear about who I share a, or what pet I share a house with in upstate New York? And, <laughs> you know, I, I do. A, I work with a lot of artists who come to me and they have me either punch up or edit their artist statements. Mm -hmm. And I don't really care about your cat or your mom. Uh, you know, as an influence, I mean, unless the, unless something really personal in your life is a direct influence on your art, I think the artist statement just has to be so clear, direct, and short. Short, straightforward. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't have to be pages and pages and pages long. Even if you're someone like, I don't know, Andy Warhol or Ansel Adams or whomever, it doesn't have to be a biography length statement. It can be short and sweet to the point like maximizing on the fact that if someone is reading this online, if you have them for five minutes, you're very lucky. You're yeah. very lucky. So from a reading perspective, looking is a little bit different, but reading that, and that's something that we're constantly trying to address at Humble Arts Foundation is like, how do we maximize this content in terms of what people will actually spend time reading? Mm -hmm. um, so it, 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 it's to your benefit, I think, to keep it short, be very direct, um, and, and for, you know, I can't, I wouldn't propose to speak for any other artists or curators, but that definitely does it for me. And the artist statement is used for so many things. It's used yeah. in cover letters, it's used in grant proposals, it's used in your elevator pitch. And you can't have an elevator pitch if you're going to go back to when you were five years old right. talking about a trauma you had with your tricycle. That's not going to make a good elevator pitch because you're going to lose the person in the first 30 seconds. So, you know, if your artist statement's clean and direct, then your elevator pitch is going to be similarly focused. Yeah. And that's often the only time we get. People don't read. They don't read very clearly, very closely, or very long, and they don't pay attention to you when you're talking to them as well. So if, you're, if you can't tell someone in two or three sentences exactly what you do with your art, you lost them. That's it. Off. Yeah. Uh, I have a following question to, uh, for all, all those three, uh, and about the con contact info, uh, I also, Really, thank you for saying men mentioning that. And I wanna ask you ask you that. Uh, is it? Do you think is it necessary to include a, like phone number, not only like email on on my own website? Just I wanna hear all of your different. I have my phone number on my website. I mm -hmm. have it on every email I send. I love it when people respond to my email and they and will say, Hey, yeah, give me a call. I'll tell them, give me a call, and they're like, How do I reach you? I'm like, have you looked at the right footer there. of my email? Yeah. I put my email, my my phone number on, I mean, i sorry, I put my email address, my phone number on every email, and it's on my website because I want people to call me. I want them to reach me when they want something. Yeah. Um, unless you really feel like you just can't answer the phone, you could. I guess you could have it go to a voicemail too or have it go to a different number that just collects a voicemail. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, I mean, if you're not comfortable, I, 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 I could go either way. I mean, I think if you're emerging, you're kind of starting out, you're not comfortable, just have your email. And then maybe once you get to a point in your career where you can have a second phone number that's dedicated specifically to the business, then maybe at that point you have a phone number. Yeah. Um, but you just play it by ear, you know. Whatever you I think most people with. aren't going to use the phone number no matter what because everyone's right. only comfortable communicating digitally on the, you know, through email and text. <laughs> yeah, right. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I have just uh, one uh, specific question for the Rola. Uh -huh. And I, I was aware that uh, you are an editor in the hum Humble Arts Foundation. Yeah. And I have seen the guide guideline on the for the e to email on emailing like sub submission things and uh, because you mentioned since you mentioned the uh, like statement should be like sh very very short with Ray also and just yeah. uh, I want to know like how how it should be like short like 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 because like statements are very to by work by work so sure yeah. so you're talking about the like a project statement yeah, right okay well that I think it, it can break down into a couple of different categories and I'm glad that Ray articulated this was so there's the there's the biography there's an artist statement if 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 it's addressing like the breadth of your practice um, and then if you're thinking about if you're writing something that is specific to a project um, I mean <laughs> If you can, if you can say it in a paragraph, something that's no more than I want to say, four to five sentences max. Absolutely, um, anything longer than that, and you will have, you will like, I'm not, I'm just not going to stick with it for that long. So, um, a project statement is specific to a series that you're working on, and then an artist statement I think is a wider explanation of um, your practice, your motivations, the questions, you know, philosophies, all. All of that and then the bio is you know that's just about who you are um so yeah i would say if you can narrow that down to you know no more than a paragraph no more than like four to five sentences like at a max i think that would be that's a workable range to to, to strive for yeah i got it. thank you so much you're welcome so i want to be mindful of everyone's time and we're almost 10 minutes past our 440 beginning mark so I just want to say thank you all so much for coming. Um, it sounds like our guests may be able to answer some more questions. So if you all have them, you can send them to me and maybe I'll, I'll send them to the appropriate parties. Um, is there any last remark from Ray, Danny, or Rula before we wrap up to the students today? You mean from us? Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, absolutely. I'm not sure, you know, where you guys are in your, uh, how far along you are in your degrees, but just if you're graduating, um, congratulations. It's, uh, it's a crazy time in the world to be leaving one context and moving into another. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, if there's, if there's anything, I don't, wouldn't propose to speak for anyone else, but if there's anything you want to talk about further, please feel free to contact me. I'm more than happy to. Um, so and as you're, if you're continuing in your degrees, like good luck with everything. Moving, you know, next year, who knows what, if it will be virtual or if it will be in person, who knows at this point, but um, good luck on your, you know, good luck on the work and just, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, I'm trying to think of something motivational and there's a buzz saw going off in the background. <laughs> well, you have that cute my, kitty. My landlord is like, he's a wood maker and he's cutting up wood chunks outside the window. I'm like, how do I concentrate? Um, you have a cat in the background too. Yeah, yeah I know. Like, there's just a lot going on back there. What's going on over there? And I even sort You're of busy, tied up to it before, but it's the beauty not. of Zoom. So, like, yeah. Um, but yeah, just, uh, you know, good, good luck with everything that you're moving forward with and yeah, you are in good hands with Adrian and everyone in that photo to pro photo program at uh, at AAU. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I guess I would say too, as you kind of navigate in your fine art world and start reaching out, and just don't take things personally. Rejection's going to happen. It's never yeah. a reflection on you uh, personally, and it, it's it's a different taste. So just let it roll off your back. Um, but just keep keep on creating and try to find that life work balance, and yeah. Um, just yeah, keep pushing through. Yeah. Good advice. Yeah. Um, well, first I want to say 
anybody can reach me either on my website, ray at raybeldner.com or ray at startupartfair.com if you have any questions as a follow-up to this or anything. Um, one thing I think it's really important to remember, you probably know this, it's probably pretty obvious to you, but it bears mentioning that you know when you leave school, as great of an influence your teachers were on you and as great as the resources they are for you, they're not always gonna be there. Who's gonna be there for you is you all, you all guys. Your, your support system when you leave school is each other. So, you know, the art world is a very tough, cruel, fun at times place, but um, we only can make it with if we help each other. Yeah. And so I encourage you all to stay connected at, in the months and years after you leave school to create crit groups, to create, you know, artist co communities of various kinds yeah. and to support each other. You may not all end up being you know, working artists. Many of you though will be in the art world as art dealers, as curators, as writers, as collectors, and you'll help support those ones that continue as artists. Yeah. And so stay connected. Thank you all so much. Thank I am you. so appreciative of everybody that joined us today. And to see all of you who popped in, um, this was such a good crew, I hope that you got some practical advice and some inspiration to take with you. Again, Rula, Danny, Ray, thank you so much for our relationship over the years as we speak of it. And I was like rethinking, oh my gosh, we've known each other for over 10 years each. Um, thank you all for joining us. And my 455 class, we're gonna take 20 minutes and we'll meet back in this room at 515. Give you two minutes extra. So come back here in 515. But for everybody else, just thank you. Thank you again. And if you still have any remaining questions, feel free to reach out to those that suggested or send them my way and we can get those answered for you. Great. So mm 